Okay, let me begin by asking if anyone has any questions from last time or, or the readings. And I see this is coming through. Uh, it doesn't look as sharp as it should. And this is a new computer I got. So there are probably some adjustments that need to be made. Anyone have any suggestions about how to improve the clarity of uh, the typeface? It's a, an XP machine. Okay, can you see it in the back, Mr. Underwood, Mr. Cunningham? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, any questions on uh, where we left off? I know we had uh, just started getting into the uniformity of profit principle. And, all right, I'll just uh, recapitulate the highlights of that. Uh, th there is this uh, major principle in economics, uh, possibly uh, the most important single principle of price theory, in my judgment, and that is uh, that there prevails a tendency toward an equalization of the rate of return on capital, an equalization of the rate of return on capital, uh, in all branches of the economic system. A tendency toward an equalization of the rate of return on capital in all branches of the economic system. And uh, we're talking about the rate of return on capital, uh, not a profit margin. A profit margin is profit as a percentage of sales. Uh, the rate of return on capital or rate of profit, those are equivalent expressions. That's uh, profit as a percentage of the capital invested. And I pointed out that uh, you can have permanently unequal profit margins uh, with an equal rate of profit, and the uh, unequal profit margins translate into an equal rate of profit uh, depending on uh, the capital turnover ratio. Uh, there are some industries uh, where the capital turnover ratio is much higher than others. For example, supermarkets uh, typically earn 2% on sales or thereabouts, but that doesn't mean that supermarkets are less profitable than automobile production, where they might earn 10% or so on sales, or that automobile production is less profitable than uh, electric power generation, where they perhaps might earn 20% on sales. Uh, what operates to equalize the rates of profit is uh, differences in the capital turnover ratio which is the ratio of sales to capital. So in a supermarket, if their sales are five times the capital invested and they're earning 2% on sales, that's uh, five times that 2%, that's 10% on capital. If in the automobile industry, they earn 10% on sales, but their sales merely equal their capital, well then they're earning only 10% uh, on their capital. In electric power production, if they're earning 20% on sales, but their annual sales are only uh, half of their capital invested, well, then they're earning 10% also. And uh, what's governing capital turnover ratios is uh, essentially uh, the technological characteristics of the industry. Uh, in supermarkets, a significant part of the capital uh, turns over every day or within a few days. But uh, in automobiles and uh, still less electric power uh, production, the turnover is uh, not so rapid. Now, uh, we explained uh, why this principle works, uh, starting from the existence of unequal rates of profit at any given time. Rates of profit are unequal. Uh, there are constantly factors at work in the economy, uh, churning up the system, uh, making them unequal. Uh, everything uh, you might recall as to what causes demand changes. Uh, anything that is causing demand changes to go on in the economy, such as uh, any one product anywhere getting cheaper and uh, uh, people having money freed up uh, to buy more of other products, uh, that operates to bring, around, bring about wide-ranging demand uh, increases. Uh, anytime uh, there is something which makes a necessity more expensive, that will bring about wide-ranging demand decreases, and there'll be uh, corresponding effects on uh, profit margins and rates of profit uh, throughout the economic system. 
and then all of the relations between substitutes and complements that we went into, uh, uh, things of this kind, uh, these are constantly churning up uh, rates of profit. But if uh, the process of changes were to stop, if things were to go on unchanged in their fundamental aspects for uh, some period of time, then the rate of return on capital would indeed actually uh, operate to equalize. Uh, because uh, starting from unequal rates, well, we know that people prefer higher rates to lower rates. They prefer positive rates to negative rates. And so uh, in the face of uh, certain investments that are losing money, others that are making money, uh, some that are making relatively little money, others that are making uh, substantial money, uh, where will people wish to invest their capitals? In the higher returns, uh, the highest rates possible, other things equal. And so capital gets withdrawn from uh, loss-making or low-profit industries and invested in the higher-profit industries. And what is the very consequence of that movement? What's the effect of the reduction in capital invested uh, in those industries which were initially taking losses or earning only very low rates of profit? Uh, what's the effect of the withdrawal of capital from those industries on uh, their ability to produce, uh, their uh, selling prices, profit margins, and rate of profit? That will increase. So the loss, the negative and low rates of return in response to a withdrawal of capital, which is caused by the losses or low rates of return, uh, the very consequence of uh, losses or low rates of return is to uh, cause capital to be withdrawn, the further effect of which is that uh, production, supply, uh, decrease, uh, price, profit margin, and the rate of profit in such industries rise. While conversely, in those industries uh, that uh, were initially exceptionally profitable, well, uh, there we have additional capital investment. The uh, high rate of profit is an incentive uh, to the investment of capital, just as the uh, low rate or loss was an incentive to the withdrawal of capital. And the high rate of profit itself is a source of additional capital. How is that? The reinvestment of the, of the profits. And now, what is the effect of the uh, uh, expansion, the greater investment, in uh, those industries uh, with an above average rate of return? Uh, what's the effect on their production and supply? Okay, their supply uh, will increase. And uh, the, uh, what will happen to their price and profit margin? Okay, that will go down, and the rate of profit will go down. Okay, so those uh, high rates are in process of coming down, while the low rates are in process of coming up. And just as uh, the high rate of profit was both an incentive and a means for the expansion of such industries, uh, low rates of profit are not only the incentive for the withdrawal of capital, but uh, low rates of profit and certainly losses uh, directly slice away capital. Losses, obviously, are losses of capital invested, and low rates of profit uh, can themselves uh, automatically be accompanied by reductions in capital invested if the rates are so low that they fail to cover uh, whatever dividends may be paid. So if you're earning a very low rate but paying a dividend at a higher rate, uh, that means capital uh, withdrawal too. So we have the basic fact, we start off, uh, some industries are earning very high rates of profit, others low or negative rates, and capital will move from the low profit or loss making industries into the high profit industries with the effect of uh, the rate of profit coming down in the high profit industries and coming up in the low profit industries. Now, if we reach this point, say, where the disparity is not as great as it used to be, but there is still some disparity, what will be the effect of uh, any continuing disparity? There'll be more movement. And what is the only uh, logical stopping point of uh, movement in response to inequalities? When will movement stop? When the rates of return become equal. That's the basis of the principle. And this principle uh, goes back at least as far as Adam Smith. Uh, it uh, has been propounded in, uh, 
in economics books generation after generation. Uh, you might find it lost in the shuffle in a text like Samuelson, but it's uh, a very major principle and it sheds a lot of light on things. Uh, and here we can turn to its significance. Uh, it uh, is responsible for achieving uh, a reasonable, harmonious balancing of the different branches of industry. Uh, everyone has a legal right to invest in any line of industry he wants to. And uh, if you knew nothing about economics, which is the unfortunate state of uh, many, many people, uh, it might appear uh, entirely reasonable that uh, perhaps everyone would plow into a few industries and uh, others would be uh, uh, utterly unprovided for. Uh, well, we have a basis of showing uh, why that doesn't happen or why anytime things are working in that direction, the process will be stopped and reversed. Well, what's the effect of too much capital uh, being invested in some lines and not enough in other lines? What happens as we have excessive investment in some branches of the economy and not enough <coughs> investment in other branches? Yes, uh, Ms. Cox, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Fox. Um, the area that you are heavily investing, your, profit, your rate of profit is going to decrease. While that's decreasing, the lines that don't have a lot of capital will start to increase. And they'll get more. Okay, so if we have too much investment in certain lines, the effect will be a uh, low rate of profit, and if it's really a lot of investment, losses. To the degree that we have ina inadequate investment in other lines, uh, what's the effect on the rate of profit there? Okay. It goes up. So uh, the very consequence of uh, making mistakes in the uh, uh, relative overinvestment and overproduction in certain industries and relative underinvestment and relative underproduction in other industries, the very consequence of such mistakes is uh, low profits or losses in the cases in which there has been the mistake of relative overinvestment and overproduction, which obviously puts a stop uh, to the further uh, overexpansion of those industries and will operate to reverse it. And uh, uh, the premium profits in the industries with inadequate investment, well, that creates an incentive and also provides the means for stepped up investment. So it's in this way that uh, the mistakes made in, relative, in the relative uh, levels of investment in different <coughs> industries uh, are self-correcting. They produce consequences, uh, the effect of which is to throw things in reverse. And it's uh, for precisely uh, for this kind of reason that uh, uh, people often talk about uh, the automatic mechanism of the market, uh, compare it to uh, a, a, an automatic governor on a machine, a thermostat on a boiler. You know, a boiler um, may heat the temperature in a room too hot, that expands some piece of metal, uh, which then shuts the uh, boiler off. If the temperature cools down too much, the piece of metal contracts, turns the boiler back on. Uh, if a machine is going too fast, uh, th there can be an automatic governor on it that slows it down. If it's not fast enough, uh, the same gizmo speeds it up. And th the uh, uniformity of profit principle is very analogous to that. Yes, uh, Mr. Levy. Is is the reason for this because the, the profits are being distributed against a smaller base of investors? Is the reason that the profits are being distributed against a smaller base of investors? No, I don't think so. It's the, uh, uh, there's too little capital relative to the demand. So uh, if we have too little capital, too little supply of the item relative to the demand, uh, that results in a premium price, a premium profit margin, a premium rate of profit. And by the same token, uh, if we have too much investment, too much production, we'll have a, a an art, an art, a, a temporarily low price, uh, low or negative profit margin, low or negative rate of profit. Could I ask for an example? I feel like a perfect example would have been like the, the bubble. Okay, the bubble, uh, we ha certainly had a relative overexpansion in uh, <coughs> telecommunications equipment. And uh, I read that, uh, that was some telecommunications equipment uh, selling for 10 cents on the dollar compared to what had been paid to buy it. Now, uh, that uh, is an example of uh, relative overinvestment. Uh, that industry went way too far. 
that would not be among the uh, usual or ordinary mistakes that would be made. Uh, the market left on its own would be very unlikely to carry things that far. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the bubble and in all bubbles, uh, there's another phenomenon going on that uh, creates the artificial appearance of more capital available to invest than exactly available. Uh, you have the expansion of the money supply, uh, lending it out in the form, introducing it into the economy in the form of new loans to business. Uh, so the appearance is created of more capital uh, being around than is in fact there. And so uh, undertakings are begun uh, for which the actual supply of capital is not sufficient. And that's where uh, the relative overinvestment occurs. And this is greatly exacerbated uh, to the extent that new and additional money is going into the stock market and driving up stock prices. Uh, if you think of the extent to which people calculate their wealth on the basis of the value of their stocks, well, uh, a bubble in the stock market uh, creates the delusion of more capital throughout the economy and can result in a really uh, gross uh, disproportionate investment. What about the opposite example? I remember um, at one point in the bubble uh, listening to a radio show about uh, he was Procter & Gamble's valuation, how all the capital that was invested in the P&G stock and traditional holding steady, it decreased because it all flew over the technology stock. And the argument was that the demand for soap is not different. Are you saying that Procter & Gamble's stock decreased in the bubble? In the bubble. Well, uh, I'm not familiar with that. That would be highly unusual. Uh, very few stocks were decreasing in the bubble unless they had some really uh, special problem. So I don't know what the story of Procter & Gamble was. The idea was that the capital was, was flight from traditional to high tech. Yeah. So I'm trying to associate that with this. Well, uh, uh, it's conceivable. I mean, people are thinking high tech is going to be so profitable, and here's Procter & Gamble in a stodgy old industry. Uh, so let's invest all the more heavily. Well, then th that would qualify. Yes, Mr. Severn. Just to add to that, um, yeah. in the industry, we had many retirees uh, abandon value-type stocks. Yeah. And on average, you have these funds that were very consistent over time. They weren't down a lot, but they were down, you know, 1% to 5% to that year yeah. in 1999 when growth stocks had taken off. Uh -huh. So there was that little shift although it was temporal. Okay, because uh, there were people who were saying, well, i got to get in on the action. Yeah, uh, okay. exactly. So yeah. they, aband they abandoned what, what has yeah. treated them well over the years, Yeah. went over here and, and, and bought lottery tickets. Basically. Okay, yeah. All right, well, to that extent, uh, you'd have not only this uh, relative overexpansion, but uh, possibly some withdrawal of capital from uh, some of the industries. Okay, so uh, I want to make you aware of the fact that uh, mistakes of relative uh, overinvestment and overproduction, relative underinvestment and underproduction uh, in a free market are self-correcting. They're self-correcting. And the same applies uh, in cases in which uh, an industry is extraordinarily profitable uh, for a time. Well, uh, what's the effect of its extraordinary profitability on uh, investment in that industry? Pardon me? Okay, there'll be a stepped up investment and uh, that will operate to bring down that high rate of profit. So this is uh, why uh, you can read stories every so often. Uh, the profits in this or that industry are absolutely outrageous. Uh, the government should come in and do something. Well, uh, if the government does nothing, uh, the market will take care of it because the very uh, height of the extreme profit will provide the incentive and means for stepped up investment. Yes, uh, Mr. Underwood. Does that apply even if the business is continuing, if, if, if new technology is continually being brought in? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, what about continuing new technology? Uh, I'd like to postpone that for a few minutes because uh, uh, I intend to deal that with that under number three. Uh, the need of businessmen to introduce continuous improvements in production, and that I think is the best place to address that. Yes, uh, Kumar. You said something about the market track is still going to be the economy. Yeah. What social is the economy? The government intervention. That's something. All right. 
Uh, you ask, are you asking uh, what is the case with a socialist economy? Because I've said only a free market. Well, in a free market, uh, you have the incentive of profit to bring about stepped up investment, and you have the incentive of loss or low profit to withdraw capital. Now, uh, in socialism, uh, does any individual official uh, lose any of his personal wealth? Or even in our economy, insofar as the uh, government is involved uh, in running anything, uh, if a government enterprise takes a loss, like imagine the post office takes a loss, um, does the uh, postmaster general, or whatever the title of the individual now is, or uh, any member of the congressional committees overseeing the post office, uh, do they lose any of their wealth? No. no. So uh, do they, d does anyone anywhere have a personal financial incentive to uh, stem uh, losses of government enterprises? No. No. And if something uh, were to be profitable, uh, is any government official uh, legally allowed uh, personally to profit from it? No. no. So what do you think is the government's response to uh, any mistakes it might make of uh, insufficiently doing something or excessively doing something? Should we expect there to be any kind of automated or automatic uh, corrective mechanism? I we'll probably want to just not make it draw attention to it. More. Pardon me? It, it probably just wouldn't want to draw attention to it. Well, they have no incentive uh, to really move. Uh, so uh, you can't expect that the, uh, the same kinds of response uh, will apply. Uh, this is a, a very, very important matter. Uh, this, the whole price system does not really apply to socialism because of the absence of uh, profit and loss motivation. Plus, no possibility, if you have a whole socialist system, uh, no possibility of competition. Okay. Uh, so now, also, uh, you should realize that the bigger the mistakes, uh, the harder they are to make. Uh, because uh, if you have a, a, a modest mistake, all right, that means a modest reduction or increase in the rate of profit. Uh, a bigger mistake means a greater reduction or increase. So uh, you're uh, leaning against more powerful f uh, counteracting forces of correction. Uh, so uh, it's very, very difficult uh, for a mistake of overinvestment and overproduction uh, in normal circumstances unless uh, 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 fanned by uh, credit expansion, this process of creating new money, introducing it in the economy in the form of new loans, uh, unless fanned by that sort of development, uh, the size of mistakes uh, will typically not be very great. And the very fact that uh, people want to make uh, profitable investments and more profitable rather than less profitable, and they want to avoid, lo avoid losses, uh, that uh, leads them to try to avoid, in the very first place, stay out of any kinds of investments uh, in which uh, they, there's a, there appears to be overinvestment and overproduction, or that have the, such a prospect. Uh, rectify uh, anyone else's mistakes of underinvestment and underproduction. Uh, jump in to where the returns are expected to be highest. So uh, this operates to uh, hold down uh, the number of such mistakes because people are exercising forethought of a kind that uh, operates to minimize the mistakes in the first place. And this is uh, reinforced by the fact that at any given time, uh, most of the capital in the economy uh, will be in the possession of people who have avoided uh, the mistake of uh, overinvestment and, un and overproduction and have done uh, reasonably well in uh, rectifying others' mistakes of underinvestment <coughs> and underproduction. All right, let me uh, say a little bit about this second point, the power of the consumers to shift the course of production, consumer sovereignty, point two. Now, imagine that we uh, had uh, a uniform rate of profit having been realized, and now some change occurs. For whatever reason, the consumers decide they want more of some products, less of other products. An example, in recent years, uh, people uh, change their uh, diet patterns. Uh, a few years ago, uh, lots of people were switching out of uh, fat food, fatty foods, uh, foods they thought had uh, high cholesterol, and uh, so that was red meat, and into things like uh, chicken and fish. 
okay if we started out with the uh, uh, cattle industry having a comparable rate of profit uh, to chicken raising and fish farming and, and fishing uh, what's the effect of large numbers of consumers deciding they want to change their diet plan on the rates of profit in these industries Beef industry will go down. Pardon me? Okay, the rate of profit uh, in beef goes down. Uh, the rate of profit in chicken and fish goes up. Okay, now what is the further effect in response to uh, these changes in the relative rates of profit? What would be the effect on uh, investment in uh, beef production? That will go down. Capital will be withdrawn from beef production. Uh, an additional capital will be invested in raising chickens and uh, and fish. And so uh, what's going to be the effect on the rates of profit uh, in these industries? Uh, okay, cattle will be coming back up. Uh, chicken and fish will be going back down. So uh, we've had a change in the pattern of demand which uh, initially operates to reduce the profits where demand has fallen, uh, increase the rate of profit where demand has risen. But then in response to this change in the pattern of demand, there is a change in uh, the state of capital investment. Uh, less capital is invested in the lines where the consumers want less. More capital is invested in the lines where consumers want more. And this would go on until, again, the rate of profit were equalized. Well, what would be different after the rate of profit were equalized again? What would be different compared to the way things were at the very beginning? We started out, uh, beef production was at a certain level. Fish and chicken production was at a certain level. And now uh, the demand for the one has fallen. The demand for the other has increased. So what's going to be different? The ratio of investment between the two industries. Okay. When you say the ra the ratio of investment, you mean the amount of capital invested? The amount of capital uh, okay. So uh, what's going to be the effect on the size of the industries? What's going to be the effect after the dust has settled and the rates of profit are once again uh, comparable? Uh, what's going to be the effect on the size of the beef industry compared to what it was before and the size of uh, chicken and fish racing uh, compared to what they were before? Beef will have shrunk. Pardon me? Okay, beef will have shrunk and chicken and fish will have expanded. So the permanent effect of this change in the pattern of <coughs> consumer demand is a change in the relative size of the industries. Uh, notice the consumers have it in their power and regularly exercise that power uh, to change the relative size of the various industries in the economy simply by changing their pattern of spending. Uh, wherever the consumers want more, uh, the uh, immediate effect will be uh, to make uh, such industries more profitable. Where they want less, the immediate effect is to make such industries less profitable. The further effect is uh, stepped up investment uh, in the industries where the consumers wanted more. Uh, diminished investment in the industries where they wanted less, and the economy is uh, readjusted, uh, repatterned uh, to fit the change in consumer demand. What if uh, the consumers decided they didn't want to buy anything uh, any longer of a certain industry? Like suppose uh, people, uh, suppose everybody uh, decided to quit smoking. Then what would happen to uh, the tobacco industry? Uh, how much capital would remain invested in uh, tobacco and cigarette production? It would diminish at the rate of what their profits would be. If their profits are shrinking, then their, their, their own source of capital would be. Okay, so capital certainly would, be, certainly would be shrinking. Now, you see, it's one thing if, uh, let's say we started out, half the, popu half the adult population smoked, and we had a cigarette industry geared to uh, producing for half the population, and now uh, we, it falls to 40% uh, of the adult population smokes. Uh, that would uh, uh, cut the rate of profit, uh, make the tobacco industry smaller than it was. But suppose it continues on down. It's 30%, 20%, 10%, zero. Then uh, what is left of the tobacco industry? Nothing. Nothing. It's gone. 
So if there's something that the uh, consumers just don't want, uh, it cannot remain in existence. Uh, anyone producing it will find he's producing something that he can't sell or can't sell at a profit. So uh, they'll stop. Now, uh, typically, uh, uh, we don't uh, take an industry all the way to the point of extermination, but uh, that would happen if th there just were no customers. Uh, if there's to be any industry of, of a certain type, uh, it's necessary that there be uh, enough customers uh, to cover the full costs of whatever size of the industry remains, plus provide a competitive rate of profit, as good a rate of profit as can be earned in other lines of investment. And if that's not the case, uh, the industry heads for extinction. Does it only work in, in legal industries? Does it only work in legal industries? Uh, you suspect maybe not in illegal industries. How would it, uh, it, it would work in uh, industries that uh, are both legal and uh, illegal. Uh, let's apply it to uh, narcotics. Uh, suppose uh, people decided that narcotics was really self-destructive and uh, they weren't going to uh, use them. Well, no, I'm saying just, we were talking about government yeah. intervention. Uh, I'm just saying it's, if it became legal, would it, would it dec uh, narcotics, for example, would that decrease the return on investment purely from risk? Okay. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't clarify. All right. Uh, right now, uh, in the uh, narcotics industry, uh, uh, for, for those who can get away with it, uh, there's a premium rate of profit. Uh, you risk going away to jail for a long period. Uh, you also risk uh, being killed by rival dealers. Uh, so uh, there are high risks associated with it. Now, let's imagine the uh, prevailing rate of profit in the economy is about 10% or whatever. Uh, do you think anyone would say, wow, uh, if I can make 11% uh, dealing narcotics, uh, that's for me? <laughs> I, I don't think so. So. Uh, uh, this, where there is uh, an undue, an unusual degree of risk, uh, social opprobrium, uh, in such a case there can be a premium rate of profit uh, to compensate for these negative elements. So I'm never even out in that case. In that case, uh, there would tend to uh, be a premium uh, compensating for the extra degree of risk, social <laughs> opprobrium, any kind of negative. Uh, 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 by the same token, uh, there can be instances uh, where the uh, rate of return might be uh, somewhat lower, like if you have an extra secure type of investment. Uh, there, the, the rate of return uh, can be somewhat lower. So this tendency toward equalization of rates of return applies, other things being equal, uh, the degree of risk, social opprobrium, whatever. Yes, Mr. Trexler. Uh, you mentioned that the consumer uh, can exercise power to change the size of the industry. Yeah. Uh, don't you think that could also happen if there's underinvestment in an industry because, it, yes, the rate of profit would be kind of equilibrium with other industries, but you would probably see a shrinkage in possibly that industry because well, maybe just that consumers because people would maybe substitute another um, product, another uh, another industry. So that under investment would cause some shrinkage in itself. Uh, no, uh, you are, I think you're referring to the fact that if there is uh, a relative underinvestment, underproduction, uh, the price of the product will uh, be at a premium, right. and uh, in response to the premium price. There'll be a reduction in quantity demanded uh, along the, the given demand curve. Um, I guess I'll think along the lines: if, if there's a shortage in supply, yeah, then you know you're going to have consumers move to another product. Yeah. Now, I think that's the the very kind of situation I was naming. Uh, let's suppose uh, we have uh, uh, some part of the oil production uh, is knocked out. Uh, by terrorists. So uh, we have a reduced supply of oil. Uh, the price of oil will go up. In response to the high pr higher price of oil, what will happen to the quantity demanded? It'll go, It'll go down. Okay. Now, that is not something making the production of oil less profitable. It's simply an adjustment to the reduced supply and higher price. Uh, what would equalize the rate of return would now be 
uh, here is uh, oil production, which has gotten more profitable. So what incentive should that provide, and what means should it provide? It should provide an incentive and means to step up oil production. Now let's imagine we had uh, a, a very extreme case. Suppose uh, there was no possibility of increasing the production of something. Uh, 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 such a case was developed uh, a couple of hundred years ago by David Ricardo. Uh, he cited the case of uh, uh, wines of a special quality uh, grown from grapes, uh, produced from grapes uh, that can only be grown on a soil of very limited extent. So suppose uh, there's a certain flavor of wine, uh, it requires grapes of a kind that have to be grown at a certain elevation with a certain temperature, a certain wind, et cetera, et cetera. And there's only uh, a thousand acres in the world uh, that qualify uh, for this. And we're producing as much as we possibly can. And now uh, the price of this wine might be very, very high, uh, a couple of hundred bucks a bottle perhaps. I, uh, can anyone uh, figure out how the tendency toward a uniform rate of profit would apply in a case of this kind? Just think, what is it that limits the ability uh, to produce these uh, special grapes? Well, doesn't this have to do with the elasticity of demand? Well, let's say the demand is, is inelastic, whatever, and there's a price that is setting the wine high enough uh, to limit the quantity demanded to the limited supply that can be produced. And so uh, it costs you only so much uh, in wages and materials and equipment uh, to produce the grapes, uh, to make the wine. Uh, what is the limiting element in production? Capacity. What, what element? What part of the capacity? What? The land. It's the, uh, it's the land of very limited extent. All right, uh, what do you think would be the effect on the price of such land if uh, this land can yield a product of exceptionally high value and it's the key limiting element and you have a product that is uh, much more valuable than uh, the ordinary costs of production, the labor costs, uh, the equipment costs, uh, chemical fertilizers, whatever. Uh, imagine that if you uh, just calculated the capital invested in the uh, casks in which you age the wine, uh, the capital that needs to be invested in paying the, the wine growers, uh, the capital that needs to be invested in any kind of processing operation. Uh, suppose the rate of return calculated on that part of the capital alone, imagine that were uh, 40 or 50 percent. That would be a huge rate of return. And here you are, uh, if you will uh, provide the capital, that amount of capital, uh, and plus you can get hold of the land, uh, you'll make this uh, high rate of return. Uh, how would this affect what would be paid for the land? The land would go to such a premium, the price of the land would go so high that when you, when you added in its value as part of the capital invested, you'd have uh, the uniform rate of profit again. So even when you can't expand uh, production at all, the, whatever it is that is limiting the output, that will acquire uh, premium capitalized value such that the extra profit will yield only the going rate of return on this enlarged capital base. Uh, you can see an example of the same principle. Uh, is anyone familiar with the uh, New York City taxi cab industry? Uh, pardon me? Yes, uh, you need a medallion affixed to the uh, hood of the cab. Now, a new cab, uh, what, may cost $20,000, $25,000, whatever. Uh, you don't have to be a genius to drive a cab. But in order to drive a cab legally and pick up passengers for hire w while cruising the streets, uh, it's uh, required that you have one of these medallions. And the City Council of New York essentially stopped issuing them or froze their number uh, at uh, about 12,000 uh, back in 1938. It was a little under 12,000. A few years ago, they added a few hundred, so it's still limited around 12,000. <coughs> and uh, the last time I heard, uh, the price of one of these medallions uh, was over $200,000. Now, why do you think uh, anyone would pay $200,000 for a taxicab medallion? That's the reason why you would buy a franchise. 
Well, similar, it's but they it represent future streams of capital. Yeah. Pardon me? It represents future streams of capital. Yes, it's the capitalized value of a premium future income. And what creates that premium future income? The limitation, the license. So uh, you're willing to pay a premium. And when you calculate the premium, uh, then uh, the rate of profit in operating a New York City taxi cab is not so high uh, relative to anything else. So where you have uh, a limiting element on the supply side and the production and supply just can't be expanded, then uh, a, a sufficiently high value will end up being attached to that limiting element so that that high value will bring the rate of return uh, down toward the general level. Yes, uh, Mr. Timotek. I just like that game for you. We were talking about the grapes to the land. If you own that land, yeah. I mean, I understand how the principle would work if there was just this land that could be used that, you know, that the people that want to work in that industry want to purchase this land. Yeah. But if you own that land, your your profit's not limited by by that part of your capital. I mean, that's, that, that fixed asset's never going to, if you're looking from a profit standpoint, isn't going to uh, increase, correct? Wait. Uh, here you are, let's say you own uh, some land. Right. Okay, and maybe this has been in your family for generations. Okay, and uh, you're, you personally are just incurring uh, relatively minor costs of production and you're selling your product at a, an enormous price. So uh, if we calculated your capital as only what has been invested in your uh, agricultural equipment, uh, your payroll, etc., uh, then your rate of profit would appear to be stupendously high. Uh, when we uh, say there is this tendency toward a uniform rate of return, we have to allow for the fact, we have to allow for the market value of the land. That market value of such land, as the, the ownership of which is the precondition to earning this huge uh, profit, uh, it would have a very high market value. And the uh, rate of return calculated on that basis is what would be tending toward uniformity. You have to, you have to be taken, you have to take value. Yeah, it refers to the market value, yeah. The fair market value. Yeah, value okay, now, if you had someone, let's say there's some present-day cab driver whose grandfather was a cab driver too, and he got his medallion, or great-grandfather, in 1938 for $10 or whatever, and it's been passed down uh, generation to generation, uh, maybe his book value of the medallion is ten dollars, and uh, he's earning the premium income corresponding to two hundred thousand of additional investment. Uh, it might look like uh, he's earning a very high rate of profit, but we'd have to bring in the market value of the medallion. Okay. Well, uh, this point about the uh, power of the consumers uh, to shift the course of production and its uh, consumer buying patterns uh, that determine the relative size of all the different industries. Uh, why, for example, is the automobile industry uh, so much larger than uh, the book publishing industry? Does that have anything to do uh, with the way people are spending their money? That people are spending a lot more of their funds in buying automobiles than uh, than books, and uh, that's what uh, brings about a much heavier capital investment in the auto industry. Now, uh, the kinds of products produced uh, that reflects uh, consumer demand. Uh, why is it that uh, 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 some part of the publishing industry? is uh, bringing, bringing out new editions of old classics like Shakespeare and whoever. And uh, another part is bringing out pornography. What does that have to do with the pattern of consumer demand? It's, uh, they're acting in accordance with the demand. They're acting in accordance with the demand. Now, if there's something that they publish that the public decides it doesn't want to buy, and what will happen to the continued publication of such material? It'll cease because it won't be profitable. And the same thing applies to breakfast cereals. Uh, you know, there, I believe there have been congressional hearings where uh, executives of the breakfast cereal companies are grilled by congressmen. Why are you producing these cereals with a high sugar content? Don't you care about the cavities of the children and all? Well, you get, it's hard to avoid the impression that uh, business firms uh, get some kind of perverse pleasure out of producing unhealthful uh, products, uh, salacious literature, 
that uh, they're getting their kicks uh, from harming the public in one way or another. Well, why do you think uh, they produce uh, uh, sweet cereals uh, rather than uh, supposedly nutritious ones uh, that don't taste particularly good? Because they want to sell them. If the uh, children uh, sitting uh, in there at the table or whatever, if they were knocking over the bowls of sweet cereal and saying, this is disgusting junk, and insisting on porridge or whatever, uh, what do you think would be the effect on the uh, uh, kinds of products the breakfast cereal companies produce? And then they produce porridge. They're driven by demand. It's not the case that uh, they somehow decide they want to produce some bad set of products and then they manipulate people into buying them. Uh, now you see, it's amazing. Uh, the congressmen uh, co can concentrate their ire on the business executives, but the business executives are really just carrying out the will of the buying public. And these congressmen are in a position really of overriding uh, implicitly the will of the consumers. They make it appear that they're overriding the will of some vicious capitalist pig executives, but uh, what they're really doing is attempting to overturn uh, the choice of the consumers. Now, uh, let me turn uh, to point three, which will connect, uh, I think it was uh, either Mr. Underwood or Mr. Trexler raised the question earlier about uh, technology. And uh, notice we have uh, this principle of the tendency toward a uniform rate of profit. Uh, we certainly don't observe a uniform rate of profit uh, at any given time. Rates of profit are very unequal when we look across the entire economy. It's just a tendency. And one of the things that uh, uh, works to keep the rate of profit uh, non-uniform is innovation. That's the major uh, factor, I think, that uh, maintains inequalities in the rate of profit, continuing innovation. And I refer here uh, to the need of businessmen to introduce continuous improvements uh, in production and do it ahead of uh, their rivals. And let's just uh, look at this. Uh, suppose one firm uh, introduces some improvement in its product. Uh, we, we can use the automobile industry. Uh, there was a time uh, early in the 20th century uh, when automobiles had to be started using a hand crank. I'm sure you've all seen movies where uh, someone has to get out in front of the car in the rain and he's cranking up the engine. And I, I don't know uh, what, when this ended, uh, maybe around World War I thereabouts. Uh, now, uh, imagine the position of a company that introduces the self-starter. It alone has the self-starter. What's going to be the effect on its uh, market share, uh, its uh, profit margin, and rate of profit? Okay, it's going to be very high. This will be an extremely profitable technology, uh, circa 1910. Okay, but now uh, this company is doing very, very well. Uh, what is the effect on uh, the sales and profits of the other automobile companies that don't have this improvement? They're down. So uh, here we have uh, a significant inequality in profits within the same industry. Uh, what do you think will be the response of the other firms in the auto industry uh, just as fast as they can? Uh, to duplicate as soon as they possibly can. And once they do, once something like the self-starter becomes the general standard of the industry, once everybody's got a self-starter, uh, can any special profit any longer be made from it? No. Uh, then uh, the rate of profit is brought back down. Uh, the low rates of profit of those who hadn't had the innovation, uh, as soon as they match it, uh, their low rate of profit will be restored uh, to the normal level. The premium profit will be brought down. Now, if, uh, you see, notice uh, you have high profits from innovation. There are high profits from innovation. Uh, if you introduce an improved product, uh, that's the source of high profits, so long as uh, it's not the general standard of the industry, so long as uh, you're alone in doing it or you don't have too many uh, others duplicating it yet. Similarly, if you can uh, uh, produce your product at a lower cost of production, and charge the same price as the others, but your costs are lower, uh, you'll have a premium rate of profit too. But again, what will the others do as soon as they learn of your premium profit? 
uh, what would they be attempting to do? Uh, duplicate your cost-cutting efficiency. And once they have, uh, what uh, will you be able to earn a premium profit on the basis of that uh, cost cut? Now, you can see this over and over again. Uh, there was a time in the 19th century uh, when uh, some firms, uh, I guess notably uh, Carnegie Steel, uh, the predecessor of United States Steel, I believe they were the first in the United States to introduce the Bessemer process of steel making, which represented a major uh, improvement in efficiency, a major reduction in cost, and they profited very, very handsomely. How long has it been since any steel firm has been able to profit uh, because it uses the Bessemer process, if anyone still does, if that hasn't been entirely superseded uh, by still more efficient methods. Okay, so no one can profit from that. Uh, uh, no one profits because their automobiles have the self-starter. No one is profiting because their trousers come with zippers. Uh, there are all kinds of things that uh, in their day were the source of special profits but have long since ceased to be. The premium profits attached to uh, improvements in products so long as uh, they're not yet the general standard and uh, more efficient methods so long as they're not yet the general standard. But once they become the general standard, those premium profits are eliminated. Well, what do you have to do if you want to maintain a premium rate of profit over a long period of time? Yes, Mr. Feldman. Well, you can have patent protection, and that will extend your uh, profitability uh, for some time. But uh, if you wanted to have a premium profit after the patent expires, you have to have further innovation. You see, uh, any innovation uh, can be profitable for a limited period, even with a patent. But then the special profit, once the, the technology is known, and others uh, are, are able to duplicate it, the special profit is eliminated. You can go on earning a special profit, but then what's required is further innovation. And I think perhaps the, the best example of this of all, uh, right from our own time, is Intel. Uh, 20 years ago, the uh, hottest thing in computing was the 8286 chip. And uh, Intel was in the forefront of uh, producing that, and then they made very good profits off the 8286. Well, how long uh, would those, could those profits last once others like AMD and whoever else was in the industry, once they're producing the 286 also, is the 286 any longer especially profitable? So what did Intel have to do to maintain its profitability? The 386. And then the same story. And now uh, the latest is uh, the Pentium 4. Now, notice... Uh, the, the high profits last only so long as uh, you're in the forefront at, or early uh, in the process of uh, innovation. And if uh, you, you stop, if you fail to continue to innovate, your premium profits will be eliminated. And if you stop innovating and others continue, then what happens to you? You pass by, and if you do not uh, catch up to them fairly fast, where do you end up? you'll be out of business. You'll be driven out of business. Merely to remain in business at all, uh, you have to adopt innovations. It's just a question of uh, how soon. Uh, you may not be the very first, but you'll have to adopt uh, the innovations of the leaders as soon as you can, so as not to be passed uh, by too great a margin, or you'll be driven out of business. So uh, a major aspect of business activity is a continuous improvement. Yes, Mr. Feldman. Yeah, just a good example, I would think, would be Kodak. How yeah. They kind of led the market early on with uh, photography and things of that nature. Did yeah, Kodak. Now Kodak has had to abandon uh, ordinary film developing because others are doing it more efficiently. There was a Polaroid. Uh, Polaroid was a, a major innovator after World War II, uh, these self-developing pictures. And now uh, that process has been uh, made obsolete uh, by digital photography. And uh, they didn't catch up quickly enough, uh, nor Kodak. So uh, no one is safe uh, permanently. Uh, any firm, however uh, big, however uh, wonderful its p uh, past accomplishments have been, uh, it can end up going out of business if it does not continue uh, to be a leader in innovation and others uh, start to get too great a, an advantage over it. So uh, no, no one's uh, 
uh, status is secure indefinitely. Uh, there was a question over here, Mr. Uh, okay. All right, now, if we look at this a little bit further, uh, there's a premium profit when an innovation comes on, but then the premium profit is eliminated through competition. And to continue a premium profit, you need further innovation. Okay, we've established that. What does this imply about who is ending up pocketing in the long run? Who is gaining uh, the benefit of all these innovations? Public. The consumer, the general consuming public. The general consuming public is getting progressively better products at lower and lower prices. The, the public is ending up with better and better products at lower and lower prices. Now, uh, uh, there are a number of things to say. Uh, uh, I make a point here uh, how the concern with profits expands production in the economy. Now, insofar as profit is the incentive uh, to introduce new, improved products, if it's the incentive uh, to uh, replace the wooden plow with the iron plow, the iron plow with the steel plow, uh, the horse-drawn steel plow with a tractor-drawn steel plow, and on and on and on, well, uh, in, from such examples, you can see how uh, the profit motive is operating to expand production, improve production. Uh, but I want to uh, develop the implications uh, just of uh, the quest to cut costs, how uh, cost cutting operates to expand production in the economic system as a whole. Uh, the more we can uh, reduce the cost of producing any particular item, uh, the more, whether we are aware of it or not, uh, the more we're tending uh, to increase the ability to produce in the economy as a whole. Now, what is one uh, very major, not the only way, but perhaps the most prominent way of cutting costs? Reducing Pardon me? Reducing labor. Yeah, labor saving improvements. Uh, labor saving improvements. Uh, that, was, that underlay uh, practically all machinery uh, produced using less labor. All right, well, what is the connection between producing any given product, any given quantity of a given product, with less labor? How can we connect that uh, to increasing production in the economy as a whole? Up labor for yeah, labor is released, and it, it didn't die off. It's there, available to produce. So whatever uh, it had been producing, we now continue to produce that using fewer people, and the people we no longer need, they're available to produce more of something else, or maybe even more of that same thing, but more of something. So uh, to the extent that uh, we attempt and succeed in producing each given thing with less labor, we're making the labor available to produce more of other things. Now, yes, uh, Mr. Levy? At this point, would you argue that another ancillary benefit is the fact that as you have more sophisticated and more efficient production processes, you're also elevating the education level of the workforce, so that sophistication is only the product is trickling down the sophistication level of the workforce? Uh, would I argue, if I understand the question correctly, that uh, a side effect of this process of improved products and methods of production is that uh, the labor force uh, becomes uh, more improved, uh, that reaches a higher level? I'd say there's an indirect connection. It's not uh, because of, of what's required in the productive process itself. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people think that uh, since production methods are getting more sophisticated, uh, you need to have more education to keep up with this. Uh, I don't think that uh, it's that uh, this progress is raising the level of uh, intellectual demands. Uh, perhaps the opposite. Just think uh, what can be accomplished using computers, uh, or just think of you go into McDonald's and you buy something and you need change. Uh, do you think many of the people giving you change would even know how to calculate the correct change if they didn't have that simple machine that they plug in how much you've given them, uh, what the cost of the thing was, and it calculates what the change is? So you're going to have people giving correct change, I, whom I doubt many of whom uh, would know how to, how to do that uh, uh, mentally or even with pen and paper. Uh, similarly, uh, you have uh, 
because of computers, uh, high school graduates, I understand, using computers are routinely able to solve mathematical problems that not too many years ago required PhDs in mathematics to solve. Uh, uh, think of furniture making machinery. Uh, furniture making machinery uh, permitted people to accomplish results uh, comparable to what had previously required skilled cabinet makers. And now you could have just semi-skilled workers using uh, furniture making machinery accomplishing results that used to require skilled cabinet makers. So I'd say the actual effect of uh, our improvements is uh, typically uh, to, uh, to lower the uh, human skill level required to accomplish a given set of results, to make it easier uh, for people uh, with any given skill set to accomplish greater results. But nevertheless, there is a tie uh, to uh, higher uh, levels of, of intellectual achievement. And I think the connection there is that to the extent we adopt the improved products and methods of production, uh, what's the effect on the general standard of living and the time available for leisure? Well, first, I'd say that it's increased. The second, I'm not so sure about because California is the perfect example. You, you have the Department of incredibly high standard of living, and everybody is, has a level of stress and busyness to let up as a customer. Okay, uh, we have a very high standard of living. A lot of people are stressed, but uh, in terms of the time available uh, that you don't need to spend at a paying job, uh, what do you think is the uh, general effect? Uh, it's more free time, isn't it? Now, what people do with the free time is another issue, but uh, they do a, a byproduct of a higher productivity of labor is that uh, people don't need as many hours uh, to produce more than they used to have with more hours. Now, uh, between the higher standard of living and greater leisure, I would say that's uh, the foundation of the population having a higher level of education and uh, uh, being generally more sophisticated. If you think about it, uh, thanks to th these various improvements, the average uh, worker in any first world country uh, is able to have a, a first class library in his own apartment or home uh, in paperback. Uh, he could buy uh, any of the great books of philosophy or science if he has an interest in them. They're affordable. Uh, he can have uh, a music collection uh, that is uh, very impressive, uh, reprints of works of art. Uh, so uh, this is working in the direction of, uh, of a rise in the intellectual level. Uh, and then there are other things which I don't think are necessary, but are present and are working in the opposite direction, and that's the, the state of contemporary education. Uh, so uh, we, we should be having a society where the uh, general level of knowledge is getting higher and higher, but uh, I, I don't think we can observe that. It's not the fault of the economic system. Uh, the economic system is laying the foundation uh, for greater uh, knowledge and education, but uh, the educational system isn't working right. All right, well now, uh, going further with cost cuts, uh, the most prominent method is labor-saving machinery. But also, uh, notice uh, uh, when you can substitute a, a comparably good but less expensive material. That's a way of cutting costs. Uh, how does that often uh, translate into a saving of labor? And thus the uh, release of labor to expand the production of other things. Question yeah, if you uh, if you can replace uh, a more expensive material with an equally good, uh, less expensive material, why would that likely uh, be an indirect way of saving labor? To less labor to produce the material. Why is the material less expensive? Well, a likely explanation, or a good part of the explanation, is that the less expensive material requires less labor in its production than does the more expensive material. So to that extent, uh, shifting to equally good but less expensive materials would uh, save labor also. Now, uh, ultimately, I think cost savings translate into uh, either labor savings or uh, uh, making it possible for labor of lesser skill to accomplish what used to require labor of greater skill. 
uh, and sometimes uh, making it possible uh, for uh, less valued materials that whose value was determined not by the quantity of labor <coughs> but by their own scarcity. Uh, we can have different materials, uh, the value of which is determined on the basis of the limitation of their supply at any given time uh, together with the demand. And uh, sometimes we can substitute a less expensive one for a more expensive one. And we'll see that that's analogous uh, to uh, substituting less skilled labor for more skilled labor. Uh, why should we expect that uh, being able to produce something uh, using less skilled labor instead of more skilled labor uh, should make a contribution to increasing overall production? Well, why? Well, yes? I'm sorry? Less skilled labor is cheaper. Well, less skilled labor is cheaper, th and that's why we'd want to do it as far as we can. But why uh, should we expect that that would translate into uh, an enhancement in our overall ability to produce in the economic system? The higher skilled workers can do higher skilled level things. Yeah, isn't it equivalent? If we can make it possible for people of lower skill to achieve the same sort of results that used to require only people of greater skill, isn't that uh, essentially similar to having more skilled people? If we can ma enable people with IQs of 100 to accomplish what used to require an IQ of 120, isn't that comparable to having more people with IQs of 120, at least to this extent? Okay, well, what do you think the effect of a more intelligent population on the ability to produce must be in the nature of the case? We should be able to produce more. Uh, what we do is, uh, when we substitute uh, less skilled labor for more skilled, uh, make it possible for it to produce the same kind of results because we're using better machinery or something of that kind, that is equivalent to uh, having a larger su supply of skilled labor available. We'll have more skilled labor available <coughs> for other things. And even if it were the case that uh, some of the skilled workers who had a given skill that's being made obsolete, even if they couldn't learn another skill, uh, what will be true of their successors? Imagine even if it were the case that uh, someone who's 50 years old and whose skill is made obsolete, even though at one time he had the ability to acquire skills, now he's lost it through rust, mental rust, uh, but his place is going to be taken by somebody else of comparable ability, and where will that other person go? Not the same place. He'll be available for some uh, higher skilled job somewhere else. So uh, this, uh, if we think of furniture making machinery, if we don't need people, uh, as many people uh, with the level of skill of skilled cabinet makers uh, to produce furniture, well then uh, there are people who would have had that potential who don't uh, go along that path. Uh, they apply their same basic level of ability to learning some, some other skill set. And uh, we have a larger supply of skills available for somewhere else. Yes, Mr. Feldman. I just was curious to get your position on the big argument of us sending a lot of jobs overseas uh -huh. yeah. for less cost and labor. Yeah. Is that hurting us or helping us? Because there's kind of two trains of thought there. Yeah. If they don't send them, some of these companies can't compete on the local level. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to lose jobs because they're going to go out of business for the people that are here. Yeah. Same time, you know, the whole other side is getting our jobs. Yeah. Okay, now you see, it's true that there are certain jobs that have been done here that will cease being done here and will be done abroad. But isn't that true uh, with any kind of free trade? Uh, we are producing something domestically, and now instead of producing it domestically, <coughs> we import it. And so uh, the people producing that thing are no longer within our borders, they're outside the country. But uh, does this mean that free trade causes unemployment? What happened to the people who used to produce uh, the goods for the domestic market, uh, who now no longer produce the goods for the domestic market, because we're importing those goods? Well, they will produce something else. And uh, I would say uh, a, a way to analyze the uh, job export issue, uh, the outsourcing of jobs, uh, suppose you start with the example uh, here's an American programmer, and he's getting 100000 a year, and the same level of programming can be done in India for 20000 a year, okay? 
Now, why does the American programmer uh, refuse to accept 20,000 a year and be competitive with the Indian programmer? Well, is it just that he doesn't like that level of living or uh, that there is some much better alternative available to him uh, that he's almost certain to find within not too long a time? There's a better alternative. He doesn't have to go uh, to 20,000. He may have to take a cut. He won't be earning 100,000 anymore, but he's almost certainly not going to have to earn as little as his Indian replacement. Uh, he might have to earn 60,000 or 70,000, which is not very nice for someone used to 100,000. But uh, notice the point is that his income will not fall to the same degree as uh, the reduction in cost of doing what he's doing. Now, uh, suppose we generalize this. Uh, suppose we think of the economy as consisting of a uh, hundred different jobs, some, however many different jobs there are. And uh, suppose we start thinking of outsourcing uh, everything. We uh, can outsource uh, every type of job and uh, accomplish it at a fraction of the present cost. cost. But the people who are doing the present jobs uh, will not have to take reductions equivalent to the reductions in cost. Suppose the general case were uh, the American begins with an income level of 100. His foreign competitor has an income level of 20. The American doesn't have to come down to 20. Uh, he comes down to 60. All right, what would be the effect on the cost of producing all the goods that we previously <coughs> were buying uh, and in which Americans are no longer working? To what level of cost will they correspond to 20. Well, now, if you're earning 60, but the prices that you have to pay are governed uh, by costs corresponding to 20, uh, how does that affect you? Does that happen? Well, yeah, because, you see, the cost cuts in the principle of the thing, the cost cuts are greater than the income cuts. And uh, we have to recognize that if you have widespread general cost cuts, they're going to show up in comparable price cuts. But in general, does that make its way to the market? Or does well, it make its way to the return of the ROE? Rate of return. Right. Okay. Now let's imagine that we started out, uh, companies are <laughs> cutting their costs to a fraction, and uh, somehow this is all going right into profit. Well, then the key question is, what are they doing with the profits? Now, uh, see, a question that we won't get into in this term, I go into it heavily in macro. If anyone were really interested, I would refer them to chapter uh, 16 uh, in capitalism. Uh, what's governing the average rate of profit in the economy as a whole in the long run, uh, there has to be, uh, it's the extent to which the amount of money spent to buy the products in the economy exceeds the amount of money spent to buy the means of producing the products. So if we had a situation where the total product of the whole economy were sold every year for a thousand units of money, each unit of money representing however many billions of dollars, if the whole uh, sales revenue of the economy could be conceived of as a thousand, but year in and year out, 900 were being spent for the means of production, uh, what do you think this would imply about the total costs deducted from the sales revenue of a thousand? <coughs> Pardon me? The total amount of costs. If 900 is spent year in and year out to produce the products, which are sold for a thousand, what should we expect to be the magnitude of the costs deducted from the thousand? Pardon me? 900, 90 percent. So what should be profits? 10%. So uh, this sort of thing, when you have reductions in unit cost, reductions in unit cost uh, will not show up, at least not lastingly, as uh, increases in the rate of profit. They'll show up as a larger volume of uh, means of production purchased, a larger uh, volume of output produced. So if you ask, uh, must this flow through to the market, when you have cost savings, if the uh, ratio of expenditure for means of production to the sales revenues, if that remained the same, uh, it must flow through to the market. It can't be retained as uh, higher profits for long. So, and this is why when we do have cost cuts, uh, you can rely on it uh, flowing through to the market. 
and a, a way to see this, a related aspect, uh, I suspect I might have given you this example earlier. Uh, imagine a Gillette uh, razor company uh, figures out a way to produce their razor blades at a sharply lower cost, and they get a patent on it. Okay, so here they are, uh, they're charging, they're, they're, they'll make by cha charge the same price. They might decide, we're not gonna sell many more razor blades if we cut the price, so we'll keep the price the same, and uh, we'll make higher profits uh, by cutting the costs. Well, the key question is, what are they doing with those profits? To the extent they save and reinvest them, and uh, put them into some other line of production, what will be the effect on production and supply somewhere else in the economy? <coughs> it will increase. And to find buyers, what will have to happen to prices elsewhere in the economy? Decrease. They'll have to decrease. So you might have a situation, there's a cost cut in one industry, it doesn't flow through right away because there's patent protection or maybe other people just can't figure out how to do it. But uh, if the profits are saved and reinvested, uh, they're gonna operate to expand production somewhere else and uh, bring down prices somewhere else. And then ultimately they'll bring down prices uh, back in this line uh, as soon as uh, the technology becomes known or the patent comes off. So earlier you, you said in it, or related to that comment, that those, those profits eventually come back out to the economy. And is that again because of that uniform way of profit principle? Well, this, is, this goes to something related uh, to the determination of where the rate of profit becomes uniform. See, so we'd have the uniformity of profit principle in one state of affairs uh, operating uh, to equalize the rate of profit at 10% in a different state of affairs, at 20% in another at 5%. Uh, so what I was talking about in the last few minutes uh, pertains to what's governing the level at which the rate tends to equalize. Because each time you say that uniformity of profit, you explain it in my mind, I keep like silently saying within a relevant range. Is that... Well, if you want to... I think it's too generalized because there's certain... Not every industry has the same... No, at any given time, uh, there'll be a, a huge spread yeah. And even uh, on a permanent basis, if there are some things that are especially risky or uh, highly disfavored, uh, that would have a premium profit to compensate for the other negatives. And uh, you see, in order uh, for a uniform rate of profit to be achieved, plus or minus whatever premiums and discounts there have to be, uh, you'd have to have the basic data of the system being unchanged. You'd have to uh, stop innovation. Uh, people would have to maintain the same set of tastes and preferences uh, so th that everything fundamental could remain the same. Then uh, it would work out toward that. Okay, now uh, I want to call your attention to something. Uh, I've uh, maintained that uh, because of the incentives to cutting costs, uh, we should expect prices to fall, that things should be getting not only better as time goes on, but cheaper. Now, in a few cases, we can actually observe that, notably uh, computers, and I had a personal confirmation today in a way. I bought a 250 gigabyte uh, internal hard drive uh, for about $200. Now, think of that, that's 80 cents a gigabyte. Uh, 20 years ago, I paid $2,500 for 40 megabytes. Now, think of what a reduction in cost per megabyte this is, and similarly with, the, with RAM and so on. So in computers, uh, you certainly see an incredible uh, reduction in uh, prices per unit of storage of uh, megahertz or whatever, uh, RAM, mem uh, uh, random access memory. But we don't see that in many other cases. Usually, uh, we're seeing prices rise. Well, uh, is this a contradiction? Is the uh, implication of the uniformity of profit principle that uh, you make high profits by cutting costs, then competitors uh, duplicate your advance, that brings the price of the product down, then you need to cut costs further. Uh, that would imply that uh, prices should be getting cheaper and cheaper, uh, pretty much across the board, uh, just at uneven rates. But uh, what we see far more often, uh, certainly in the last, uh, for most of the last 100 years, is uh, uh, prices rising from year to year. 
Well, can anyone uh, reconcile uh, the implications of a principle, which I'm saying is really a solid and true principle, uh, with our observation of prices actually rising uh, for the most part in most years? All right, inflation, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Trexler? Well, I think there's just an increased demand period that the population or the markets are expanding. Okay, now, now we have uh, an expansion in demand for everything, and Miss, uh, I'm awfully sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name properly, Wei? Wee. Wee, okay, thank you. Uh, Miss Wee refers to inflation. What do you mean by inflation, Miss Wee? <coughs> Because as more money gets pumped into the economy, things are, um, there's more capital than people, the economies cost items to be higher, people pay higher. Okay. Uh, uh, if, if by inflation, uh, you mean, uh, you're referring to more money being pumped in, yeah. that's, that's essentially it, uh, not uh, every last increase in the quantity of money, but certainly uh, increases at an undue rate uh, and you, you could take as a rough guide to the standard uh, below which it's not undue and above which it is undue. I think you could take uh, uh, the rate of increase in a gold money, uh, there would be some rate of increase, and inflation is uh, the rate of increase in the quantity of money over and above that. Uh, perhaps a, the rate of, uh, an increase in the quantity of money uh, greater than, say, 2% a year. And that would be uh, the essence of inflation. And what is the effect of uh, new and additional money on uh, people's ability to spend? That increase it. And so that's what operates to raise the demand uh, for everything. Uh, it's not more population. Uh, suppose we didn't have an increase in the quantity of money, but we had more population. And now that means there's more people out there seeking jobs. What's the effect of a larger number of job seekers in the face of the same demand, what would be the effect on wage rates? Wage rates would be going down, but uh, what will allow more people to be employed at the same wage rates, or and even higher wage rates, is an increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending. Well, uh, we actually have two processes going on uh, at the same time. On the one side, <coughs> Profit-seeking businessmen are uh, introducing ever better products and ever more efficient methods of production, which are operating to increase the production and supply of everything and operating to bring prices down. That's the effect coming from the side of business. Then we have another process coming from the side of the government, which issues the, which issues the money supply, and they are issuing uh, a larger quantity of money each year uh, at a rate more rapid uh, than the increase in the supply of gold and at a rate more rapid than uh, businessmen are able to increase the production and supply of ordinary commodities. Yes, Mr. Zink. So are you saying that it is necessary to increase the money supply periodically, but that has got to be within a certain balance? Uh, am I saying that it is necessary to increase the money supply periodically, <coughs> but uh, it has to be within a certain bounds? What I would say is that uh, in a free market, there would almost certainly be some increase in the quantity of money. Uh, I hesitate to say that it's necessary to have a certain rate of increase. Conceivably, and there are some economists who have argued uh, that we could have a functioning economy with no increase in the money supply. I don't think that uh, would come up under a gold standard, but uh, that's their position. Uh, and if so, prices would fall the more rapidly. Now, uh, what we have is, uh, if you put everything together uh, and you think of people in your own company, you think of you yourself. Uh, how many hours do you spend in connection with your job? And how often are you putting in uh, uh, hours above 40 hours a week? And uh, what kind of hours are put in uh, by people uh, playing a really key role in your company? I think uh, it's very, very common uh, that businessmen are staying up late into the night uh, and they're engineers and, and scientists and so on uh, uh, doing as much as they can uh, to improve production and make it more efficient. And if you uh, put it all together across the whole spectrum of the economy, uh, maybe in a good year uh, between them all 
they could succeed in increasing the overall production and supply of goods 3%, 4% in a year. That would be high. And that's uh, working as hard as they can, as conscientiously and efficiently as they can. Okay, how difficult is it to increase the quantity of this uh, paper money, uh, 3 or 4% a year, or twice that rate? How difficult is it to expand the supply of this? What does this depend on? Do we need people discovering new processes of, uh, of ink production, uh, new processes of printing paper? Yeah. What do you need to uh, manufacture more of this stuff? Do you need the presses, the paper, and is there a shortage of any of this? Is there a scarcity of any of this? Okay, so, and also, what is the cost of producing uh, a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill? It's, just in, it's inconsequential, less than a penny a piece, I'm sure. All right, so imagine for a moment that uh, paper money uh, were subject to freedom of competition. And here we are, we start out, the cost of production of a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill is uh, a penny, let's assume. But what's the initial buying power? Well, a dollar or a hundred dollars. What kind of implied uh, rate of profit is there? What kind of, pro what kind of profit margin is there? If you have something, if you have a product that you can view as a hundred dollars and the cost of production as a penny, isn't this the most profitable, the, the highest profit margin industry in the world? And the rate of return uh, would be incredibly high. All right, what would happen if this were open to free competition? So that if you could uh, have a good likeness of Washington and uh, Grant and so forth, uh, and get the right paper and the right ink, uh, you could be in business. What, what does the uniformity of profit principle imply about the rate of profit to be made in the production of paper money if it were subject to free competition? It would be reduced to the general level. Uh, this would mean that uh, the cost of producing a dollar bill uh, would approach a dollar bill. Uh, the cost of producing a hundred dollar bill uh, would approach a hundred dollars. Uh, that's what would happen under free competition. And what do you think would happen uh, to the value of the money? Would such a money, would such a thing even be used as money? Just think, uh, today you go into a supermarket, you have a few bills in your wallet, they come out with a shopping cart full of bills. So uh, you're happy to do it that way. What if you had to go into the supermarket with a shopping cart full of money and come out with a wallet full of goods? Do you think uh, such a money would remain as money? No. It would be dumped in the sewers. This has happened to some monies uh, in the course of history. It happened uh, to the German mark in 1923. I think it happened to the Hungarian florin around the same period of time. That happened in uh, the 1790s to the French uh, assignats. Uh, it happened in nationalist China in 1948. So uh, 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 prices in such a money would be in the millions or billions. And if you think about it, uh, if you look at uh, other things of comparable cost, the cost of producing a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill is really uh, not significantly different than the cost of producing a paper clip or a rubber band. Uh, suppose you were calculating prices of automobiles in terms of paper clips. And say you can buy a hundred paper clips for a dollar. Well, how many paper clips would it cost you to buy a $25,000 automobile? Well, you'd have to multiply 100 times uh, 25,000. That's two and a half million paper clips is uh, the paper clip price of a new uh, medium priced automobile. Uh, why should we expect the price in dollars uh, to be permanently different if they have a comparable cost of production and nothing physical limits the production? That shouldn't be a big shock. Well, what does uh, limit the production of dollars is it's not open to free competition. It's a monopoly privilege of the government. And so uh, it's not increased in quantity overnight to the point of destroying its value. But what does the government do each year?
what do you think happens to the quantity of money from one year to the next? It's increased. Now, the government is not uh, uh, immune to the kinds of pressures that uh, have an effect on ordinary people. Uh, the government knows that uh, it costs it virtually nothing to produce additional money. Does it have any need for additional money? Aren't there all kinds of people with their hands out to the government saying, give me money, give me money uh, for all sorts of programs? Now, if the government were not to resort to creating money, if they couldn't create money, uh, where would it have to get the money to satisfy the demands of the people who want something from it? They'd have to impose additional taxes. Well, uh, that is not that would not be a popular arrangement. Uh, just think how hard it is that the government can uh, buy votes by giving people money. That's what it amounts to. Uh, 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 the president introduced uh, this pre prescription drug benefit. Uh, do you think uh, the votes of elderly citizens played no consideration, played no role? Well, that's a program that uh, he's hoping will attract uh, some votes to his party. Now, suppose in doing that, he said, yes, uh, here I'm offering the new prescription drug benefit, and at the same time, I'm raising taxes to pay for it. Well, he might have some votes of some elderly people, but what about the people who'd have to pay the higher taxes? That wouldn't be very popular. But if the government has the ability to expand its expenditures without raising taxes, and what is it that enables it to do that? Well, it's got the ability to print money. So uh, the expenditures are not closely tied to taxes. So uh, the government yields to such pressures. Uh, they're not doing it uh, to such an extent that the value of money is utterly destroyed in a short time. But uh, from year to year, they are increasing the quantity of money at a rate more rapid than the increase in the production and supply of goods. And to the extent uh, that there is this difference, what happens to prices? They go up. So uh, the way uh, to think of uh, how prices are rising while the uniformity of profit principle implies they should be falling, well, we're expressing prices in terms of something that is getting cheaper faster than most goods. You see, it is true. The uniformity of profit principle is out there working to make practically all goods cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But the value of the money is cheapening faster than the value of the goods. Let me give you uh, this illustration of the idea, then we'll take our break. Uh, back around 1970, pocket calculators first came out. And a new pocket calculator at that time, a pretty primitive thing, uh, was selling for about $400. Uh, VCRs uh, were also appearing at around the same time. And a new VCR at that time was selling for around $2,400. All right, suppose you wanted to express the price of a VCR in terms of pocket calculators. How many $400 pocket calculators would be required to equal one $2,400 VCR? Six. Six. Okay, now, what has subsequently happened to the price of both? They have both certainly dropped, but I don't think they've dropped to quite the same degree. Now, uh, 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 let us assume uh, that the price of a new VCR uh, is today uh, $200. Maybe it's actually cheaper, but make the assumption that it's $200. And the price of a comparable pocket calculator to one that used to cost $400 is now $10. And now notice, uh, VCRs used to be six pocket calculators, and now how many pocket calculators at $10 per pocket calculator would be required to buy one VCR at $200? 20. 20. Okay, what's happened to the pocket calculator price of the VCR? It's gone from six to 20, right? So in terms of pocket calculators, the price of VCRs has risen. But what has happened to the price of both expressed in ordinary money? It's both, both have sharply dropped, but if we express the price of the one in terms of something whose own price has fallen even more, uh, fallen from uh, $400 to $10, while the other has fallen from $2,400 to $200, where we have this inequality in the rate of fall, 
if we express the price of the one that has fallen less in terms of the one that's fallen more, what, what has happened to the price expressed that way? It's gone up. It's gone from 6 to 20. Well, that's the way to understand the rise in prices. Uh, it is true that the uniformity of profit principle is out there working, for the reasons I've explained, to bring down the price of virtually everything. But we're expressing prices in terms of a unit, the paper money, that is getting cheaper faster. The paper money is in the position of the pocket calculators. The ordinary goods and services are in the position of the VCRs. So the profit motive is driving down the price of the VCRs, but if we express them in paper money, the value of which has declined even further, prices have risen. And prices would, as I've explained, be in the millions and billions if we had free competition in paper money. So uh, the fact that we observe prices rising, while our principle implies they should be falling, there is no contradiction. They are reconcilable when you realize that uh, what explains it is that uh, the value of paper money has declined more uh, than the profit motive has reduced the, uh, the cost and price of uh, ordinary commodities. Okay, let's take our break here, and I hope uh, this has uh, sunk in, that uh, you're following it. If you have any problems with it, please raise questions on it when we return from the break, okay?